So, morning everyone. Morning. How are you today? Good, super. Um, right, we are in week number three of a series that we're calling Broken. And the tagline of this series is that no one, absolutely no one, gets through life without taking on board some damage. And of course, the fun thing about this subject is that it gives us permission to talk about what other people did to us and how it was somebody else's fault, right? So here I am today and I'm living a broken life and I can tell you exactly who it was that caused that brokenness. I can tell stories, I can name names, I can demonstrate how those people ruined my life. And, and there's legitimacy in that approach. Um, it's good, I think, and healthy sometimes to talk about the various ways in which we've been damaged by other people, about how their life and their choices have changed the complexion of our living. Fair enough. But we also need to talk, in the interests of honesty and balance, about the various ways in which we have damaged ourselves. We need to talk about the percentage of the problem that was our fault, for which we are to blame. And it doesn't matter what that percentage is. It might be that you're broken today, and it's mainly somebody else's fault. I know it probably was mainly someone else's <laughs> fault. Um, but you know, there's 5% of it, 5% of it, for which you are to blame that was your fault. And you need to own that 5% and talk about it and learn from it. Or it might be that you carry all the blame. It might be that you're in a mess today and it's all your fault. Well, you need to own that as well and talk about it and learn from it. And we shall, as always, take our learning from the Bible, which, when we talk about self-inflicted damage, is a resource-rich book. With the exception of Jesus, I can't think of a single <coughs> biblical character who wasn't seriously damaged in some way. In fact, I can't think of a single biblical character who at some point in their life didn't make huge mistakes. Indeed, so much so that from a biblical perspective, it's perfectly proper to say, especially to the young, you will make mistakes. There will be times in your life when you get it wrong. You will take a position, you will make a choice, you will engage in behavior, the net result of which will be negative for you. And to say that that's not the case is not only naive, it is insidious, because it places a pressure on you that's unrealistic and unbiblical. From the perspective of the Bible, you will fail. You will make mistakes. But in the story of the Bible, we find characters whose failure is rarely final. And I say that because failure often feels just that. It feels like you've blown it, that you've come to the end of the road, and that's it for you. But in the Bible, we meet these strange people for whom failure is, is eventually a bit of a preparation for something else. And it matters before we go into this morning's Bible story that you get that into your head. When you fail, and when it's your fault, it feels final. When your choices have proven to be silly, when they've taken you to a place of inevitable and negative consequences, it feels for you that you've come to the end. That for the rest of your days, you're going to be living a diminished half-life. But it doesn't need to be the case. Because it's often the case that failing at something is preparation for succeeding at something else. Something that would never have happened had you never gone through the failure. 
This morning we're going to look at an obscure event in the life of one of the Bible's biggest stars, Moses. The event is recorded in the book of Exodus, chapter 2 and verse 11. Now, what's significant for me about this story is that it's the first piece of action in the Moses story. Uh, up until this point, the writer has told us about the background into which Moses was born. He's told us about the circumstances of his birth and so on and so forth. So up until this point, it's all been biography. And now with this verse, we're into the action, the first action of one of the Bible's biggest and most important characters. And we read that one day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard labor. So uh, you've seen the movie. If you haven't, there's a new one about to come out. Um, you know that Moses was an ethnic Jew who was raised as a well-to-do Egyptian. And so when this sentence talks about Moses growing up, it's talking about the period after Moses has completed his, his rites of passage into Egyptian adulthood. Uh, this is the late Bronze Age. It's a period of history in which Egypt is, is extremely powerful and highly advanced. So Moses, as a well-to-do Egyptian, has just graduated from an elite university in the world's richest and most powerful nation. And so he's meant to have graduated with a certain worldview, with a certain set of assumptions. In broad terms, those are Egypt is a great nation. Egypt deserves to be a great nation. It has the best engineers, the best scientists, the best soldiers, the best economists. We're great. And the means with which we achieve our greatness are always justified. And in the late Bronze Age, one of those means was slave labor. And at this point in the Bible, large numbers of those slaves are economic migrants from Israel. So this is Moses' worldview, at least it's supposed to be. The people of Israel came to our country to work. And we jolly well make them work. We make them build stuff that will one day feature heavily on the Discovery Channel. We don't care about their well-being. We don't care about their conditions. They are beasts of burden that fuel the well-being of our prosperity. 99% of Moses' fellow graduates would have had this worldview. But notice, the story immediately says, the story says, that immediately following his graduation into Egyptian adulthood, he goes to where his own people are, and he observes their hard labor. So Moses seems to have been raised in two worlds. On the one hand, he had a life of wealth and privilege, but on the other, he was raised with an awareness that he was a Hebrew, that he was descended from these economic migrants who were building the wealth of Egypt. And it seems that this latter aspect of his life interests him. And so what is described in this sentence is a process whereby he makes himself aware of what's going on in the world, which is never a bad idea. So he finds out as much as he can about these poor people who are building the buildings of ancient Egypt. And the more he discovers, the more angered he becomes. So far, this is good. So far, there's nothing untoward whatsoever in this sentence. Stepping out of this story for a moment and into our lives, it's fair to say that our mistakes are often precipitated by a growing awareness that something is wrong. And the more aware we become of the wrongness, the more frustrated we become. So, for example, you become aware of the fact that there is a lack of love and intimacy in your marriage. You become aware of the fact that the career you chose 10 years ago hasn't taken you where you wanted it to. You, you become more and more aware of the fact that your friends are using you, that your boss is mistreating you. And awareness of those kinds is a good thing because the first step to getting a better life is becoming aware of what's wrong with the life you've got. Uh, in, 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 in social studies, they talk about a thing called, called the cycle of change. Uh, lots of studies have been done on this, and those studies show that this cycle exists in all sorts of changes that a person might want to make in a person's life. Let me just talk you through it. So at the very top of the cycle, 
you have what sociologists call the pre-contemplation phase. Uh, so this is where you are, are aware, perhaps dimly aware, that there's a problem somewhere in your life. But you've accepted the status quo. And consequently, you have no intention whatsoever of doing anything about your problem. You've just accepted that that's the way it is, and that's the way it's going to stay. And sometimes this is where we find ourselves. We're aware that there are aspects of our life that are not all that good, but that's fine. I know I'm too heavy. I, I know I spend more than I earn. I, I know I smoke more than I should. I know my boss is unkind. I know I'm in the wrong career. But, you know, I'll just shrug my shoulders and I'll accept that that's my life. That's the way it is. Uh, then, a little bit further around the circle, you have what's called the contemplation phase. So this is a bit more intentional, a bit more positive, right? So now you're beginning to be unhappy about the problem. Now some of your thoughts and fantasies are about not being like this anymore and transitioning to being something better, something different. And so it bugs you and, and you find yourself thinking more and more about what's wrong with your life. You know you should change, you know you should make some alterations, but you still don't have a plan. You've got some whinges, which is good, but no plan. And then moving a little further around the circle, you move to preparation. So this is where you begin to come up with a plan to deal with your problem, to improve your life. So, for example, if you're upset about your health, you might buy a gym membership. If you're concerned about your career, you might upgrade your qualifications. If you're concerned about your mental health, you might go and see a therapist. Um, and, and this stage, uh, this is the stage where Moses is at, uh, this stage of planning to deal with your problem, the stage of planning to move yourself forward in life is a, is a good place to be, great place to be. But it's a place laden with some dangers. Here's the rub. It's good to be aware of what's wrong with your life. It's good to be thinking about how you might improve your situation. But not every move you make will be a move for the better. Not every plan you come up with will take you where you want to go. Some of the things that you do to improve your life will end up making your life worse, not better. So here's Moses. It's exactly where he is. He's aware of a problem. He's aware of how unsatisfied he is. He's aware that he wants to do something about this problem. He's coming up with a plan. This is where he is. And then we're told that he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. So for him, this is the tipping point in the story. This is where all the frustrations that he's felt over the previous months and years come home to roost. And, and he wants to do something. And, and still we're in a good place. Still this is positive. It's, it's good to be aware of what's wrong, and it's good to want to do something about it. It's, it's good, and I know some of you have been there several times, it's good to come to a place in life where, where you just can't take it anymore. Where, 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 where you finally snap and say, I can't do it like this anymore. I can't go on like this anymore. I can't keep taking this anymore. I can't live like this anymore. Something's got to give. Something's got to change. Still, there's nothing wrong. Still, this is positive. Still, we should admire where he's at. Then we read. Interesting little detail. Looking this way and that. And seeing no one. He killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. So this is where Moses has his Jason Stratham moment. He, he sees a man doing nasty things and he steps in and beats him to death. The word killed, by the way, that's used in this sentence doesn't mean, doesn't mean killed as such. It doesn't mean killed in a premeditated murder kind of way. It means he just lays into him, uh, gives him a beating, and the beating sadly uh, results in death. 
And, and you'll notice that the act of beating a man to death is sandwiched by two interesting little details that indicate a lack of certainty on Moses' part. So in the first part of the sentence, we're told that he looks this way and that, just to be sure no one sees what he's about to do. And then at the end of the sentence, we're told that he buries a man in the sand so that no one can see what he's just done. And I think that's fascinating. Because if you make a move to improve your life and you find yourself having to look around to make sure no one's looking, if you have to be secret and sneaky about your plan for betterment, then maybe that's a sign that you're making the wrong move. So on the one hand, you find yourself having to make a move. You have to do something. Your life won't get better unless you take action. But if you're ashamed of the action that you're about to take, that shame, that desire for no one to see you, for no one to know, is a sure sign that you're acting contrary to your conscience. Similar things, of course, can be said about the areas of our lives that we need to cover up, that we need to bury in the sand. Those, I think, are the areas where we know and know well that we made a wrong move. We all have our secrets. And those secrets are our mistakes. They are the episodes, the decisions, the choices that at the time felt right, at the time made perfect sense. But with hindsight, they shame us. And we're afraid that if those choices ever see the light of day, we'll, well, we'll be in trouble. And so, and so we do exactly what Moses does here. We, we bury them out of sight, out of mind. And so for an opening piece of action in the life of the, one of the Bible's greatest stars, this, I think, is a fairly ignominious beginning. He graduates from university, gets angry, beats a man to death, buries him in a shallow grave. There are moral issues here. By no stretch of the imagination is this anything other than horrible moral failure. Was it all his fault? Were there mitigating circumstances? Is there a context? in which his behavior might be understood? Well, of course, that's always the case. But Moses has to own what he's done. The percentage of blame that can be attributed to him is in some ways irrelevant because his behavior now leads to consequences. It always does. Next sentence. We're told that after that he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? So clearly at this stage he, he thinks he's still on track to improve things. Uh, his mistake of yesterday is buried away both in the sand and in his conscience. And it's business as usual. Which in some respects I suppose is fair enough. We, we need to do this. There's no point in dwelling with things. There's no point in beating ourselves up over the mistakes we've made. Just you know, may as well get on with it. May as well get on with the job. And the job in this case, is to help his fellow Hebrews improve their lot in life. However, the fact that the sentence is introduced with the words, the next day, indicates that something unexpected is about to happen. And that's the thing with the plans you make, right? There's always a next day, and a day after that. And you don't really know how it's all going to pan out. You think you do, you hope you do, but you don't. If it's true that actions always lead to consequences, it's also true that consequences are not always clear and not always foreseeable. So he's out on another fact-finding mission, learning as much as he can, figuring out as much as he can how he can improve his own life and the life of his fellow countrymen. And he sees two of them fighting. Now, the word fighting in this sentence is the same word that was used in the previous sentence to describe what happened with Moses the previous day. One person is laying a beating onto another person. And so the point that the writer is making in using this exact same word is that, is that there's hypocrisy here. 
Moses is indignant when he sees people doing the very thing he did just the previous day, which, which raises a note of caution for us. When we think about the ways in which we can improve our situation and when we come up with a plan to that end, it's good. It's good to be focused. It's good to be single-minded, good to be determined. But we can be so focused and so single-minded, so determined, that we blind ourselves to, to the pitfalls and the flaws. And others often see us far more clearly than we see ourselves. So one of the men who's fighting says, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then we're told that Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. So this is the moment when he knows the game is up. Now the time scale here I think is interesting. We almost never feel our failure at the actual point of failure. Take, take money as an obvious example. We don't notice our bad spending habits while we're spending. We don't feel the impact of buying more than we can afford at the point of purchase. We, we feel it four months down the road when, when our credit cards stop working and when, when the unfriendly man comes to cut off our gas. Uh, that's often the nature of failing. It's, it's a slow burning fuse, but eventually the bomb goes off. And the bomb in this case is pretty large. Next sentence. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. In the culture of ancient Egypt, the, the place of Midian was a place of revulsion. It, um, it was a place where shepherds raised their sheep, and for some reason, uh, that and all that was... was uh, was hated in ancient Egypt. It was, it was the ancient equivalent of getting posted to, I don't know, North Bay or Winnipeg. Or, <laughs> <laughs> no offence, but it's not. Of course, of course. No offence meant, but, you know, it was that kind of thing. It was a sign that your career was over. Right? It was a sign that you'd reached the end of the road, that you'd come to the last chapter, that you'd know where else to go, that your life, your happiness, your prosperity had flatlined. You'd long since seen your halcyon days. I need a, a drink, excuse me, a drink of coffee. <laughs> um, do you ever feel that in life, that, that, that you've, you've seen your best, that, that whatever else is ahead is certainly not going to be as good as what's behind? That you're never going to be as happy as you once were, never going to be as prosperous as you once were, never going to be as content as you once were, never going to be as fulfilled as you once were, that, that life has taken you to a cul-de-sac and, and there's no way out. Uh, surely you do know what that feels like. And, and that feeling of frustration is, is compounded when you feel that a big percentage of that's your fault. That you're to blame. Horrible feeling. Now, I think it's, it's true to say that we never understand our miseries and our emergencies at the time we are experiencing them. So in this place, Moses is only aware of the fact that he's failed. His own people, the Hebrews, have rejected his leadership. They don't want anything to do with him. His angers and passions have caused him to kill someone. Now he's wanted by the law. And he finds himself in the middle of the desert with no food, no money, no prospects. Things look bleak. Everything has backfired. He has taken himself to a cul-de-sac. No way up. No way out. It's just blah. And that's the end of that episode. Hope you found it encouraging. Um, you're welcome. Here to help. So let's try, I mean, we can talk about your questions in a moment if you have any. Let me try and land this for us a little bit. Um, 
it's biblically true to say that your greatest failure and your greatest disappointment is, is an opportunity for not only for a great encounter with God, but, but, but for betterment and improvement. Uh, spiritually speaking, there's an experience of God that can only come from humility. There, there is, I'm sure you've noticed, a depth, a richness to the way people know God when, when they've encountered a significant failure. Uh, Moses, as I'm sure you know, goes on from this point to have quite a significant story. He goes on from here to live a very rich, deep, varied life as one of the Bible's greatest stars. And, and, and that rich and depth and, and, and value of character would never have been possible if he hadn't gone into this cul-de-sac, if he hadn't known the sting of failure and the disappointment of defeat. Failure and defeat are necessary often to make us into different, better people. They just are. Another thing that we could say and should say is that failure, particularly the self-induced kind, changes our perspective of, of God uh, in a bad way. It makes us think that God doesn't, doesn't like us. And, and surely you've been there. Uh, it's over. I've done it this time. This is how we think. We think that God is disappointed in us and therefore we kind of have to hide from him as Moses is doing here. I'll run away and I'll live a half-life. Biblically, we have to correct this and say that, that, that we are fully known and fully seen in all our brokenness and yet fully loved. Fully known, fully seen and fully loved. We can't fathom that, I don't think. We can't fathom how God can fully see us in the entirety of our being. That he can see us in our worst moments and still love us. When we're children and we talk about this business of God seeing, we think it's kind of an unpleasant thing. Like the big eye in Lord of the Rings, it's, it's somehow negative and and, and I mean, God watches, we think he watches to catch us out and find us out. This is unwelcome. And yet in the Bible, there is a connection between God seeing and God loving. To talk biblically about what God sees is also to talk biblically about what God loves. And so, and so in biblical understanding, to talk about you in that cul-de-sac, you in that place where failure has brought you. You in that place where you are suffering from the consequences of your own behavior is also to talk about God perhaps being closer to you than, 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 than he was when everything was going great. We should also say that the biblical way to think about mistakes is to say that the accusations of our conscience are full of half-truths. Uh, yes, it may be true to say that you have a coloured past. It may be true to say that you often struggle with the darker side of yourself. But that, biblically, is not all that is true. It is also true that you have a Father in Heaven who loves you. It is also true that you have hope. It is also true that that if you are down today, you will get up again. Today, fair enough, you mope around in the darkness, distracted and unsure because of the, the memories of what you've done. But in the darkness into which you've wandered, the Bible says God will light a way. Yes, you have fallen and are prone to fall. Yes, you hate what you've done and are prone to do. Yes, you grieve at what your choices have made you. But Jesus is for you. And you will rise again. Failure, biblically, isn't final. And anyway, here we come back to change and then we can go to your questions. Sometimes, I, 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 I know this doesn't seem kind at the time. But sometimes the place of failure is good. 
Because the place of failure forces you to think about what you need to change and how you need to improve. When everything's working out in life, even if it's not that great, you're just kind of plodding along. When you're in that place, you're, you're often not thinking about changing because everything's working. Things aren't that bad. But when things fall apart, it forces you to get up off the sofa and, and move a little bit further around the cycle of change and think, what can I do to change myself and improve my lot? Never a bad idea. Any questions? I think the Bible... I think the Bible relates to the question. The Bible in some ways describes the water in which you and evidently everyone else myself included, are drowning. Most famously, there's that passage written by the Apostle Paul where he talks about, on the one hand, being very aware of what he should do and shouldn't do. So this is our experience. We, we're all aware of this. I know what I should do. I know what I shouldn't do. I know what I should bring into my life. I know what I should get rid of in my life. And yet in the next sentence, he talks about, I can't do it. I find this tension in life. I find this struggle in life. Um, I don't do the things I should do, and I do the things I shouldn't do. And I'm caught permanently in this tension between, between, between the Christianity that would take me one way and, and, and the sin in me that would take me another. So that's the tension of the Christian life. What is, I think, comforting about the tension? I don't have advice on how you can resolve that tension. I don't particularly think the Bible does. Apart from the usual stuff about just make an effort. Just get a grip. But that, we know that already. <laughs> That's the problem. I can't seem to make an effort. I can't seem to get a grip. Um, I think what I find comforting about the tension is that there was a time in my life when I really didn't, didn't care about Jesus and certainly didn't care about what Jesus thought of my life. Um, um, in those days before I was a Christian, there was no tension. Uh, there was no inner turmoil between the Christian thing to do and the other thing to do. There was just the other thing to do. And I didn't really care. And then after I became a Christian, I suddenly found this other world inside me that created tension. And, and the existence of that tension, I think, is comforting because it is, it is indicative of of something else going on in us, something positive, something wholesome. So, no good news for you, yeah, really. Just, <laughs> just, just, just tension. But, but it's important because I think the silly thing to do is to give up because of the tension. Right? You know, I keep making mistakes. I keep blowing it. I can't be a Christian, so I may as well give up. That's stupid. That's silly. I think it's far more wholesome to say, I'm struggling. I have tension. There must be something good happening. And I'm getting it wrong. Move on. Move on. I quite like that, actually. Um, so, it's, it's a common criticism of Christianity, and it's a criticism that you can't help but relate to. You know, we're, we are created sick but commanded to be well. Um, valid though the criticism is, it's it's you know it's a bit like asking the question, what would life be like on another planet? We don't know. We don't know what the story of the Bible would be like if the story was different, because we only have the story we have, and the story we have is you're right, a story of brokenness. And, and we know about brokenness because we know that it feels, it, it feels slightly wrong, doesn't it? We, we don't even need the Bible story to know that brokenness is wrong. When you fail, when your choices take you to a bad place, you don't need to be a the theologian and something to understand that something bad has happened. You instinctively know it's innate in our humanity. I've messed up. I've done something I shouldn't have done. I should have played things better. I should have done things differently. 
the, this is the tension and the progress of the Bible. As I said last week, it starts on page one in paradise. On page 360 or wherever the last page is, it ends in paradise. But the story is paradise, paradise lost, paradise restored. And in between paradise being lost and paradise restored, there is this whole other story. A story in which you live and I live, where, where we make mistakes. Where, where we live in this tension between what we were, what we are, and what we one day will be. That's the tension of our lives, it's the tension of our faith. It's certainly true to say that, that as far back as we can go and study the development of our species, uh, 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 there has been rules. So, I can't think of a, a single historical anthropologist who would say that the creating morality um, is not innate in our species. I, I can't imagine it. That morality varies from culture to culture and historical period to historical period. But um, as long as our species have walked on this earth, they have, in one form or another, uh, governed themselves with, with morals and rules, which, which in itself is interesting. Um, it, it's just in us to believe that there's right and wrong, that there's good and bad, that there's moral and immoral. It's, it's just in us. Whether that says something about, about, about God or not I, I, is another question. That's a matter of faith. But it's not a matter of faith to say that, that our species always feel a morality and, and govern themselves accordingly. That's, that's an archaeological and anthropological fact. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we, We leave here today again finding ourselves in a place of tension between knowing and not knowing, between doing and not doing, between taking the action we ought to take and doing the, the, the action we ought not to. And as we go on out into this week and continue to struggle with these things, we ask that you will walk with us closely, that you will give us peace and confidence in our hearts to do the right thing. That you will give us reassurance of your forgiveness where we find ourselves doing the wrong thing. For our families, we pray for blessing, for prosperity, and for happiness.